Welcome to Living in the Matrix. I'm Jonathan, and I'm left of center. And I'm Rich, and I tend to lean a little bit more to the right. But the bottom line is, is together we try to look for the balance of what it means to be human in today's world. Well, let's get started, everyone. Uh, welcome to Living in the Matrix. I'm Jonathan, and this is my co-host, Rich. Say hello, Rich. Howdy, folks. Hope everybody's having a great day and looking forward to a great weekend. Looking forward to getting back together one-on-one -on -one with my good buddy, Jonathan. Let's go. Yes. Uh, so today we had kind of an interesting, we had no guests scheduled and Rich and I talked about an idea of kind of current topics around the matrix in life and really that is relevant to this podcast. So what we wanted to do was have a, uh, sort of a discussion on a couple of videos that we found. So here's the first video. I'm not right, I'm not left, I'm not Republican, I'm not Democrat, I'm not Libertarian. I'm a human being that wants the best for the rest of the human beings and I want some common sense and I want to be left alone, I want to pay low taxes, I want to be able to go build things and prosper and get all the things that have been promised to me in the constitution of this country. That's what I want and until people wake the up and stop identifying with left or right, Republican, Democrat, black, white, gay, straight, all the shit. Until we figure that out and stop doing that, we will continue to be abused by these people who hold the power. What do you think? Yeah, I, th I think what the guy is saying. What's the first thing that stands out to you? Well, he well, I I don't know what he where he really leans. Um, like everybody leans one way. We have we all have lenses, right? Now, perspe and right. perspectives. But um, I like where he's coming from because he's starting to bring. Um, clarity to the idea that there are factors it appears to be that are driving divisions, right? There are, mm -hmm. um, there are, maybe it's beneficial that, that we remain divided. Um, we all know that when we're in a high cortisol level state that we're um, suspect of to different levels when there's a fear of, of, of things happening, right? Whether it's immigration in the, in the Southern border, whether it's a new, coronavirus or something affecting mosquitoes or Ebola found in some person, you know, a hantavirus. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that um, the mainstream media seems to perpetuate this stuff, right? And 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 we've got our Fox News that has it on right of center and our others that, that right. are left of center. So I think what he's done is he's identified the fact that, you know, at, at the end of the day, if we could all look at ourselves in the mirror, we would all want to prosper. We would all want to say, yeah, I, I don't want to kill anybody. I don't want to... Um, cause problems. Uh, I might debate somebody, but um, if I could live my own life peacefully and, and work hard and, and not have a shit ton of money taken out in taxes, I, I'd want the best. I, if everybody gets that same benefit, then everybody wins, right? And so how do we separate, you know, all of the bullshit that's being foisted upon us and come to that same agreement on certain things? The biggest challenge to this, again, is you have to live on a farm you know, that doesn't have any outside access to avoid all of the division because you're going to be exposed to it no matter where you go. So how did we come up with that solution of what he's talking about? Well, I, you know, the thing that really uh, got me about what he said was common sense. That's the first thing that really grabbed me. Well, his opening of I'm not left or right, because yes, I don't like the idea of being left or right that i need to define myself i have to separate myself from you i don't like that idea i like the us first the we like sean talks about mm -hmm. i think there's a lot of value but i'm also recognizing that doesn't the we doesn't um exclude the i the i exists this avatar exists and i think both together it's always a both and like going back to david artman it's a both and approach. Love, mm -hmm. the kingdom is ultimately both. And it learns. Grace to, extends to all and uh, grace alone saves. Me. Yeah. Meeting in the middle. That's yeah. the, this place is where love exists. And I think that's mm -hmm. the thing that I'm, throughout this entire process of doing this podcast, I've realized we've explored ideas in people's lives that are around polarities. And it's the polarity that is where all the emotion is. And I, I keep coming back to Brittany and that middle point of how do the poles come and meet in the middle and recognize the validity of both sides. And I think that's what I, I there's a passion in what he said around common sense. Like you look at Washington and it's just 
this is arguably politically the worst time in my life. And I was around for Nixon, Reagan getting shot, all the impeachment shit. This is the most concerned I've ever been for our country ever. And I think that's the common sense that he's talking about that's missing. So well, that's let me ask you this. I, and I agree with you. Um, and I think we all, we all know that every generation thinks the Antichrist is around the corner and there's plagues and pestilence and, and the shit that's in the Fed. I mean, imagine the United States in the um, early 1900s with the Spanish influenza that killed 15 to 20 million people across the globe. That was that was terrifying, right? And in World War One and World War Two, but even then, what we have now is something that seems to be so overarching. It affects everything about us, our psyche, our livelihoods, our future generations, our planet. And one of the things that's starting to really um, scare me is that the United States government, you know, is not the big philanthropist that that we've flouted ourselves to be, right? I mean, it doesn't right. take a lot of, of, of uh, I mean, even... Um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was on with an MSNBC host, and he basically mm-hmm. just said, we blew, we blew up the Nord Stream pipe, pipeline. We did it. Duh. Right? And you're seeing um, with Tucker, and you know, we've basically admitted that, yes, the CIA was involved in the assassination of JFK. Like Back in, in the 60s, of course, we, we were always a little confused about it, and, and even Oliver Stone thought there was something funny with a magic bullet. Like, how does this bullet go six times through the whole body? So here's the thing. Right. The other reason why it's scary is because you're realizing – that there is no left to right. There's only power. That mm-hmm. the Mitch McConnells of the world are, are not the good guys, right? The right wing, the, re, the the Republicans aren't necessarily the good guys. The Democrats aren't necessarily the bad guys, or vice versa. Well, we have right? the Clinton family and the progressive side. I mean, it's like it's like the cabal of power. It's 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 wild that politically, yeah. here's what's. I always look for what's going to be the black swan that can change a culture. You know, like Me Too was a black swan type of idea where things change rapidly and quick in an age of social media. In a good way, though. Absolutely in a good way. Harvey Weinstein was taken down for years of predatory behavior. That was a good black swan. But when you've got Klaus Schwab saying there's going to be a black swan event and the World Economic Forum is talking about a black swan event, that's the wrong kind of black swan event. That's the kind of black swan. Yeah. I also think that the black swan could come out of nowhere because here's the reality. If you really boil the 1% down to anything, it's they're not part of the majority. The power of any culture and society is the capacity to gather together collectively enough with love that it can overwhelm the corruption. And that's people standing up and saying, I am like something needs to dramatically change to create like Buckminster Fuller said, the only way to change something wrong is to create something new. And I think that's what he's talking about in that video is we need something new. And I think that is some, that something does not look like what we have. We can keep yes. our structural system of Congress and senators and presidents. I think that's works, but we've got to really look at what are the levers that are corrupting that. And it is ultimately the corporation and its capacity to own the media. And uh, basically all, you know, that's the nature of social media now is that it's not totally under control of all of that, even though they own it. They just make money off it. But what happens in those streams is all. So it's, I think we need something new that fundamentally changes our way of life in a positive way. And I think that's the arc of this whole last four years of greed is good capitalism is, is it reaching a point where the cat's out of the bag? Like Kennedy was shot by our government. You know, it's like, those are the kind of things that when the cat comes out of the bag and then UFOs show up, does anybody, is anybody shocked anymore by our own corruption? Because I think we can see that the system is corrupted on both sides, Trump and Biden. They're both part of the corruption and the system that is controlled by money. So, um, one of the things I was going to ask you though, is about the, the, the love thing. So one of the things that I, I, I'm hoping that takes place is that there is this divine, this, this movement that tries to actually effectively change our consciousness. I think the call it God, 
Mm -hmm. Jesus, the, the, the universe in its gen, in, in its way of trying to craft and, and help us. Yes. Something transcendent needs to happen because we're not going to wake up and have that sense of love. The, the thing that I'm, I'm mm -hmm. re recounting is the people that when they have their first child, they see something new, as Buckminster mm -hmm. Fuller said. They've got something new and they've got something to fight for and they've got a purpose. And they start to know, even through a tough like, childbirth and all this stuff, they start to learn what love could really be in a real tangible way. They didn't have that sense. They had maybe love their wife, but now they've got something new. And um, sometimes I, I'm going to give you an interesting example because the whole we, we talked about DEI before, which tends to, to, to divide people, right? You got, oh, my God, these people are trying to do reparations right. and they're bringing in people. We're going to get we're going to get killed because we've got a pilot who was um, quick. Uh, routed through the system and the person doesn't know how to fly a plane, but they did it for DEI sake and somebody's going to die. Right. So that's a on this side. And then on this side, it's like, no, going back to the old discriminatory days of where white patriarchy. Now, what was interesting is um, I was talking to a gal today who was a professor uh, at, um, at ASU um, and she's also a coach there. And she was saying that somebody in this diversity class that she was in was like, well, you're privileged. So how can you come? She goes, honey, you don't know anything about me. I was the poorest person. On, I wore my, my brother's jeans, right? So here's a gal who's in academia who wasn't given um, a silver spoon. And one of the things I, I thought of was like, how do we come up with creative ways to bring people together that actually educates and creates empathy or at least the other? So yes. we, me, me and my wife were celebrating with that bonus that um, she got. And we were at a cafe in Ojai called Tres Hermanas. And I thought, hey. Is this called Tres Hermanas because it's based on the three sisters running the place? She goes, no, it's about three agricultural things for the indigenous people, how squash and beans and corn all grow together almost in a divine symbiotic way that helps sustain a culture. I'm like, damn, that's so cool. That's the mm -hmm. three sisters. And right. I'm thinking that's something new that I liked. It creates a sense of, um, of curiosity we, mm -hmm. we, I, I learned something new and, and an other that brings together and it, and it brought me that. And so how do we create a paradigm where outside of having a, a new relationship or having um, some kind of extant thing, bring you into a situation where you're almost brought into the kind of love, how do you foster ideas that begin with curiosity and shared common interests so that we do get to that point, right? Because we could be beating our heads all day long if we don't have a good formula. Well, I think I would go back to Paulo Freire here. So Paulo Freire wrote Pedagogy, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Of the oppressed. Yeah. And yeah. for our listeners who don't know, because it's a it's an esoteric work, but it's brilliant. It, he studied how people come out of oppression. And uh, he, I think he was the Chilean minister of finance or something like that. I can't remember. I think he was Brazilian. Or Brazilian, yeah. Um, but the point is, is that in order for change to happen, the oppressor will never voluntarily give up its power ever. That's just not the way the oppressor will work because exactly. they believe that if they let go of that oppression, the the masses are going to kill them. So they'll never let it go because they, they they rule by fist and power. And what he said is the only way to uh, get the majority to see their oppression is to establish their dignity. You have to teach people of their own dignity and value so they will learn that they are valuable enough to fight for. Ontologically. They, yeah. yeah. So you have to have a meaningful reason to participate in your own restoration uh, or re removal from oppression. And I think that's what's missing is first the story of the collective here, because what that what is happening is the polarities. You're either left or right, black or white, gay or straight. And what is what does that look like at Britney's center point in the middle between all of those polarities? What's the center? That's love. And I think what's missing is, hey, you and I are neighbors. You want to agree not to harm each other? Like simple agreements like that to say, listen, let's just agree to trust each other. And how big does that trust circle exist? Like what if we could establish simple ways of establishing trust between people so you know that it's there and that's the fabric. Digitally, you could do that. 
And the and so it's from there all of these creative ideas can happen because people learn to trust each other. That's that's my point. Is I think we are at a state where we need a structure of trust because that's what our parents had. Our parents had. Remember when we were kids, you didn't worry about your neighbors. You know, mm-hmm. it's like a lot of people. You left made, your bikes made, in the driveway. You left the bikes in the yeah, driveway, right? Was, all kinds of stuff. You assume the best of your neighbor, not the worst. They weren't. You know, yeah, we had racism. Okay, that's the one we had in spades, but yeah. the polarity was dominated by the white party. So it wasn't even like they were in control. Going back to Paula Ferrari, the question is, how do we rise up in awareness of our dignity so that we will fight for ourselves? I think that's the first question we have to answer is, like, look at the founding fathers of this country. What made them say, hey, screw you, Europe, you know, England, we're going to, this is our land now, and to fight for that. Because well, we, there was a lot of oppression, obviously. There was, a, it felt like okay. they didn't have autonomy. I'll give you oppression. I'll give you yeah. oppression okay? I was in San Jose. Uh, yesterday, and I picked up the Mercury News, and homelessness in San Jose has doubled in the oh, last God. two years. Okay, doubled. I'm sorry, not in San Jose, in the Bay Area. So the the oh, whole okay. peninsula yeah, and, the, I, but, and the horseshoe. Actually, yeah, it's doubled because of the cost of living. Like a house in mm. San Jose, a three two is one point five million. Think about that. The logic of that, you know. But for eighty seven thousand so dollars, you know, twenty five years ago or thirty years right. ago, right? Well, yeah, thirty years. So when uh yeah, I bought my dad's condo for uh or I sold my dad's condo for a hundred and forty thousand dollars back then, it's now worth one point four million. So we were talking about that. Uh it, it's like life is out of balance right now. That's the problem. Life yes, is out of is. nobody, I don't yes. want to take anybody's billions away. I don't want to do that. I want a better way so we don't need people to be billionaires. That's my wonder of how we create that. How do we create a world that doesn't need billionaires? Like let's use AI for that. Well, you've got a um you've got an ab- absolutely excellent case where, you know, you can talk about politics, but you can let's talk, let's talk about our Gen Zs and our millennials. These poor kids are working their asses off their 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 degree with they're saddled with debt they don't i mean you watch these poor girls get on tiktok and talk about i've got a job but i, I can't even go out this week and i could barely even f- feed myself right and it takes away hope and and that that this is a huge thing there's tens of thousands if not millions of, of people out there that are in this particular position and if you don't have family that you can hook up with and, and, and create new paradigms. I mean, my, my, my sister's going to yeah. move to Northeast of Spokane with her old husband. They're going to get back together and develop 20 acres out there in Northeast Washington state, like a hundred miles away from Canada and, you know, 30 minutes away, 40 minutes away from Idaho. Maybe that's what it looks like. And maybe that's where community comes from to try to get back to grassroots. And maybe that's where farming and getting back to the basics happen. But because how else could you insert something that's going to change that? You know, I mean, well, Trump's going to try to drain the swamp and, 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 and get things back to where they were prior to Biden coming into the office. Right. Which people were relatively happy uh, The um, we had energy independence. Um, homelessness um, was bad, but it wasn't as bad. I mean, it's literally gotten so bad. Now. It's partially, partially because of inflation. Yeah. But we've got a border where you've got millions of people. Now people are starting to get killed and finally mm-hmm. people are having vigils about it. I mean, people are getting raped and killed every freaking day all across this country by, by people who don't give a fuck. And that's, I don't know how you start to make an impact on that without some kind of external presence saying, hey guys, it's all going to be okay and we're going to fix this. And even Trump, God bless him, can't come in and make it all go away. I mean, what, what's, what, what, what can he do in that regard? I mean, I, I, I tend to, I mean, Dude, Biden literally said uh, on a press conference today in Flo- and, and he's in Texas in Brownsville. He's in the he's, he's in the non painful part. So he's got these optics of, hey, everything's fine. Yeah, we only had 12 immigrants come across um, over the last <laughs> few days, whereas Trump is in Eagle Pass, where thousands of them come across all the time. But he literally just said he, all these houses are getting burnt up except for the ones with the right roofs. Now, you know where that comes from. There's a conspiracy in Maui where all of these and in Chile. Oh, yeah, the blue roofs. If, you, if your roofs are blue like Oprah's, like Zuckerberg's, like all these other people, then you don't get torched by the DEWs or whatever it is. So he literally lets that escape because his mind isn't there. And, um, you know, so what the heck do you do when you see 
somebody say that they're right in front of you on in, in fucking in front of television. I mean, I just saw it blow up all over Twitter because somebody says it was this edited. No, he literally just said that. What the hell does that mean? And that's where I think that adds to the confusion because you've got a presidential address, you know, and you think you should be able to rely on that, you know. Yeah. And so anyway, did you see Mitch McConnell's breakdown? Oh, God. oh I've seen him. Like, he's frozen, ca- catatonic. I mean, he's literally yeah. like, looks he like was a lost. Turtle. Oh God, completely. that was a dementia like, type moment. 100%. I don't know if it was dementia, but it was like he just had no, he had nothing in that moment. You could see it in his eyes. if not catatonic. Yeah, he was he was standing. He didn't collapse like yeah. a bunch of broccoli. But yeah, he he's done. He stepped down, right? But I don't know if you know this. His sister. Oh, he's not just, stepping down till September. Oh God, as the leader, because he wants of, to of go the, through all the election cycles. Shit. Oh God, please yeah. no. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, his sister in law was just killed. Oh, really? Uh, supposedly it was a car crash where her car landed into a river and it was like an accident. And they're like, no, I don't think that was an accident. There's something going on, dude. That, that's, where start, that's, where, that's, where, that's where we're living in the matrix where this conspiracy st- shit comes in. And All right. I, I, Let's go to number two. We, we got to move All on. Right. I know. Yeah. No, this was a good conversation. I like this because it was, it was, you know, we both got to share some thoughts about it. So I like it. All right. Uh, which one did you want to do next? Um. You pick one. We could do well. Um, we could do the ice bath one. Let's do the let's one do the, the, uh, cold, cold the funny one. one. Yeah, it's okay. a little more, more practical. We could talk about some science behind it too. You know. Okay. I lost my penis in an ice bath. For fifteen minutes, I had no shaft. I lost my pecker in a cold plunge. I had two balls, now I have none. What'd you think that that was creative? I have to give that guy like supreme props for creativity. I thought that was very, I was brilliant. What'd you think? Yeah, a lot of different ways to say that uh, hopping in an ice bath's bad for your pecker and your, and your gonads. Um, so he, here's the thing. Let's talk about where this, the origin of these ice baths started. And then we can talk about how it recently got okay. more, and more popular. So there's a guy named Wim Hof, who is this guy from the Netherlands. He's a Dutchman, and he's always exposed to this cold stuff because it's freezing out there. And what he started doing was these combinations of ice plunges and just cold exposure, as well as um, deep breath work to help, you know, get your body and mind in this amazing state. And, you know, over the course of time, you can watch him just become more and more flexible and, and, and have this energy and almost this craziness. And then as you start to pile up the YouTube videos, you watch people who have been bedridden with some types of inflexibility, some kinds of disease, other types of problems where after they start doing these cold plunges, they start getting better physiologically, more flexibility, less inflammation, more of a will to life, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that was like, years ago i mean he's been doing this for years but more recently um with the that you know the introduction of i mean co- athletes have always had ice baths right when they're done with their stuff so uh, traditionally if you're in a sports room like if all these guys at, in, at the nfl they're, they're going to have a really rough day out there and they're going to come off the field and they're going to hop in that ice bath mm-hmm. which helps that kind of um beat up body right their bodies get beat up all the time and it helps um kind of restore that now, the whole idea of the, uh, believe it or not, though, with the cold plunge is like, no, you want to do it first thing in the morning because that's what activates all of the good properties. And we've seen things like with Dr. Brecca talk about three or four things that happen when this happens physiologically. Number one is it um, introduces cold shock proteins to the body. The liver mm-hmm. sees that immediate danger and introduces these proteins, which help, you know, get your dopamine, mitochondria and other levels that, which also mitochondria spins up in, 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 in firing up the powerhouse of the cell through, um, the brown fell brown fat activation. So brown fat gets activated as well. On top of all that, he was saying that 
you know, if you look at it physiologically, doing like five minutes of an ice bath is the equivalent of doing like hours of high intensity workout in terms of actually shredding fats and, and in terms of doing things like putting your body into a state immediately of having done exercise. And then other people like even look at it like, hey, if you do this in the morning, it's the hardest thing you're going to have to do all day. It's going to help you get through the day. So there's so many levels of that, right? But now you're starting to see the repercussions and the, and the, and the, and, and the pushback. And some of these people like you do know that your body thinks it's dying, right? When you jump into a frozen lake or if you're like ice fishing yeah. and you fall in, your body is going to go into full-blown fight mode. Let's talk about the cortisol spiking, the adrenaline, mm-hmm. all that type of thing that goes to your body. Why would you want to do that to yourself, right? Um, for a for a 20 minute dopamine rush or an hour long dopamine rush that you get as you come out of that whole process. Mm-hmm. So I think really what it comes down to is another one of these kinds of scenarios where we're in a world where we're exposed to all these kinds of things. Oh, you you having a rough life? It's your gut biome. Here's 80 mm-hmm. million different products that you can produce. This yeah. tablet, this pill, this probiotic, this kind of um, diet to help with your gut biome. And then you realize that some of this is absolute bullshit. You don't even know what's happening. So to, to just to answer your question in a short, cause I do ice baths, right? I'm, I was in one yesterday and it was 36 degrees. And I will tell you, it was fucking amazing. I was coming off of, you know, a little bit of a bender and I just hopped in there and dude, it was magnificent. I, I, I didn't even breathe. Like once you've done it, you get it. You've got the muscle memory and it, well, you, I, I've yeah, not no, been, you know, you can do it. So it's just a matter yeah. of doing. It. Yeah. But I, I normally am in the 40s and sometimes I'll settle mm-hmm. for low 50s, but 36 is a big difference well, between 36 cold, degrees. Dude. Yeah, it's a big difference between 36 and 48, you know. <laughs> there is. Yes. Well, you um, got to that's new level of memory. It is. Yeah, You're reaching is. a new level cuz here's the thing is I think the pros of ice bath infinitely outweigh the cons because to the first point the you're putting your body into a state where it thinks it's dying is the biohack. You're using yeah. that state to your advantage by teaching yourself to do hard things. And the the hardest part about life is that we don't know what we can do until we're in the moment we're required to do it. And in that moment, sometimes we can't do it. So we reach a limit and ice baths are a mental process of challenging yourself and saying, okay, can I get in the fucking water at when it's 36 degrees, you know, and, uh, you're teaching yourself resilience through that process to discover you can, cause you haven't died yet. The, in other words, the potential for death is so ridiculously small and the value benefits physiologically, mentally, and to the next point is when you start valuing yourself and seeing what you can do, that inspires confidence and courage. And you can start doing new things because you learn, oh, most of my limitations are things that I've created for myself where I said I can't. Well, the value of being our age is we can call bullshit on ourselves and say, oh, well, wait a minute. I learned when I was six, I couldn't, but maybe when I'm 56, I can. And that's, that's the value it's, and it takes eight minutes a day. And the value of it is like, we drink coffee and the value of coffee lasts 15 minutes. That's all it lasts on your body because it simulates the same idea of a cold, of the cold shock protein. The value of the cold the, of the ice bath lasts two to three hours. Mm-hmm. So there's there's infinite value to this process. I think it's and I think you know back to the video quickly. It's creative that it got to that level of culture that they're now doing satire on it because it's really funny. I thought it, it's it's integrated itself into society as a norm now. That's true. That's a good point. And and to, to add to that is that. Um, well, uh, what I was going to say is, <clears throat> in terms of the benefit, I think people who really do it consistently, it, it it's the same kind of thing as, as, as having a good diet and keeping that intermittent fast. It's the same thing yeah. as meditating, and it's the same thing as um you know 
as, as the ice plunge and, and, and the exercise. When you maintain these regimens and you do them again and again and again, it builds that process in you, right? And yes. like success begets success, right? And so I think when you overcome these things, it probably could even help with addiction. It could help with relationships, et cetera. One of the things that our um, other guest, um, Nate Taylor, said from Keyspan is, you know, when you've got a community that gets together. And so he's trying to build this health care community with health span and, and, and a community of not only people with good ideas for diet, fasting, you know, um, blood, blood work and, and, ha- and mm-hmm. taking some supplements, but they also get together uh, and they do cold plunges. Right. And when you have that shared community of a potential situation that is very challenging. Right. When I went my five days, we, we were seven of us in this fast brutal. There was parts of it where we're like dying, right? We're sick of the freaking lame soup or we're sick of, you know, this little cracker or this weird propylene glycol um, water we're, we're drinking to do stuff. But at the, that. Same time, yeah. at the same time, when you can build a community that kind of shares and kind of almost a shared misery, but a shared challenge that you overcome, kind of like you see running groups. Um, I mean, I watched, um, we were uh, walking downtown, um, Ventura, and they were, um, me and Hunter were walking downtown, and we saw this, um, we, we, we did a four-mile walk ourselves, but they were just finishing up a marathon. And what was amazing about this marathon wasn't just the fact that people were running a marathon. These people were all coming in now. It was like five and a half hours, so they were, they were, the, they were, they were, they were the laggards, right? You mm-hmm. want to do a marathon to qualify for Boston, it's three something, 315, 330. I did my, my only marathon on 425 and I only trained four months or two months for it. So I, I didn't do that good, but these cat, these cats were coming in at six minutes, six hours. And yet the family was still coming around them. So what this was doing was all these people were gathered by family. And to think that this person who dedicated, you know, six months of training and beat up their body for 26 miles, which less than 2% of the population's ever done, um, that brought community together too, right? And so this is a support network and people talk about when they go through these things. I wouldn't have been able to do it without my wife who took care of the you know, kids when I had to do my long um, runs. And so maybe what, as we're talking right now, Jonathan, we're talking about ways to actually overcome the problems we just talked about in our first discussion. How yeah. do you build a sense of community, love, purpose, mm-hmm. and shared... Um, joys and shared tri- tribulation that you overcome that i mean anybody you black white oh, yeah. gay oh, yeah. um hispanic republican uh transgender Any anybody, can do a, anybody can enjoy the benefits of an ice bath or, or a right. marathon and overcoming something that's challenging and maybe that's or enjoying a good meal whoa mm-hmm. the flavors of that were incredible yeah i never had plantains in my life with this kind of you know jamaican stuff right or whatever so let me speak you know, to that real quick. Yeah. Let me speak to that real quick because you just brought up a really good point. Is I don't think people can get to the capacity to enjoy things together because that's the value of the meal. Like my family was all about the meal, but you can't get to the point of the meal until there's trust. And I usually don't trust you. Because you potentially could hurt me. And that's sort of the general malaise keeping people apart. We've got to find a way to help people get back to the center rather than being so polarized. It's the polarity that's keeping us from the dialogue that happens in the middle. And I think that's the, uh, th- that's the problem that we've got to solve. Um, yeah. And I like the way he cre- – you know, here's – you and I got on really extensive biohacking over the last year and a half. Mm-hmm. And what has been your overall experience of it? Um, so a few things. I would say that um, consistent versus – consistency is more important than high intensity. So working out moderately three to four times a week is better than working out once really intensely, Right. Mm-hmm. I think having having the consistency is key. Learning things about um, limiting caloric intake and having those 12, 14-hour windows of not eating, which helps slough off dead cells, right? We've learned physiologically that when the body is deprived of, of a source of nutrition and, and calories, it goes into a state of looking at the cells in the body and becoming very efficient at at, at getting rid of the ones that are actually bringing us down. Right. Mm-hmm. So I would say like that was, it was a huge aspect. Um, and the third thing is, you know, 
um, and when we go through T-SPAN, they talk about getting sun. Like there's a daily journal, right? Did you oh, get yeah. enough sleep? Did you get 20, 20 minutes of sun? Did you get in your exercise? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what, what's your attitude like? And, you know, um, did you get your meditation in, right? So these are things that are very holistic. And when you can actually bring them all together, this is where I, I, I think, and this is where I think people are legit. It's, it's kind of common sense, but at the same time, um, it, it's still hard for people to overcome. I, I, we follow, you've heard of carnivore Aurelius. He's been on Joe Rogan and oh, yeah. Um, yeah. he's, he's the carnivore diet guy, right? I mean, mm-hmm. he's talking about grounding. Oh, we talk about grounding too, right? Mm-hmm. Um, grounding. And these things are like so basic and it's almost as if we just go back in time to the early days when we were out there, you know, changing this, the, 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 the face of the United States, right? We were hunting, right? We were chopping wood. You're making things with your own hands. Even people talk yeah. about when you're making and, and cutting your own vegetables, these are all part of that symbiotic relationship. And if we go back to the basics instead of processed things and, and fake artificial things, blue light from Dr. Cruz, I think mm-hmm. we can actually overcome a variety of ills, the ills that we talk about of depression, anxiety. Now, we know bipolar, that's almost impossible to um, to alleviate outside of medication. There's just something so broken there, right? That if people get off their meds, they just, it's really bad. But are there parts of um, anxiety and depression that if you did spend your time having a good diet, good quality community time with people who love and share interests, diet, exercise, you know, sun, these things mm-hmm. and meditation, could we alleviate a lot of this stuff? And is this another reason why we are somewhat um, us versus them in terms of big pharma. And, and, and you look at the kinds of things every, every single time somebody starts bagging on some other thing, they come up with something new like Ozempic, right? So that's what I've learned this uh, over this season. I, you know, what's interesting is I, um, I've done uh, ground. I got a grounding sheet, right? I ex- extensively feel like I'm sleeping better consistently. I, I like your, that's your wife just was okay with it. Story. I bought mine and my wife says, no, I'm not, I'm not. No, she was not totally, putting... We put it under a normal sheet. So it's the sheet. Oh, you do put sheet. it under. Okay. Yeah. We put it under the sheet, but that still works. It still works. Uh, okay. I was told yeah. that it, it likes it. If you like it, that you should have contact with it. So if you're telling me it has effectiveness um, underneath well, the sheet, then that might be a good it fit. Has for me. Good. Um, I've done fasting. Fasting to me has been the most beneficial thing I've probably ever done for my health. I simply reduced the quantity of food and I have, I basically lost 30 pounds of basic fat. That's right. And that was profound and I've kept it off. Um, I eat two times a day and on weekends I have dessert Um, and I may have more than that, but typically on the weekends, I'm pretty good during the week and I've been able to maintain my weight. Um, so that's been hands down the most beneficial. Um, I was, uh, doing sun gazing every morning for five minutes with my eyes closed, but it worked wonderfully. And I've noticed I've been out of that habit and I feel like my body misses it. It's weird. It's like my body keeps like, dude, go outside for five minutes, you know? And it's, it's a wild process that happened to me of just, my body started craving sunlight. It was wonderful. Um, and I think, oh, no. it, I saw I think it brightens one my day, mood. And I'm like, I got to go get that. And like Dr. Cruz, I, I've seen a, a Twitter picture of him. You've got this line of sunlight, even through, even though it's through a window and all the, mm-hmm. and all the mammals, you got three dogs and two cats lined up only in the sun. Right. Yeah. And they're like, they get it. Right. I know. So I, I happy watching I, the sun, a dog just kick it in the sun for like hours like dude a dog's life man look at this dog my dog right? likes to lay on his back and his stomach to the sun totally hey he's he's, he's tanning the perineum don't forget yes, he is. that's supposed to be important too in the ball right if you got him <laughs> so, uh so i bought a cold bath and i have not used it yet part of that is because <laughs> it's like 110 degrees here in the summer so it's hard to do anything in the summer and in the wow. cold it's hard to start in the cold i've i've bailed on that one i have not been successful um i haven't bailed on it i just haven't gotten to it i'm still going to get to it because i have it um i uh dramatically reduced my alcohol intake I think that was another thing that I've, this year I kind of said, I'm comfortable with two drinks on the weekend. I don't need to, I'm, I'm totally comfortable with it. That was actually pretty easy. Uh, The thing that changed 
and I think the thing that I think had the most impact was really the idea of switching my brain from this won't work to this will work. And that's the idea of manifesting. I think mm -hmm. that's really the core of manifesting is this idea of switching your brain from the negative to the positive potential. Mm. Because when your brain is operating on the positive potential, you're always believing in yourself and believing that it can happen. And you're looking for the signs of serendipity because we need serendipity along the way. We need the breadcrumbs. If you're not looking for the breadcrumbs, you're not going to see them and you're not going to have the motivation, the recurrence to keep going when it gets really hard unless you've developed a maturity to keep going. Because if you yeah. don't have resilience developed, like I'm trying to teach my kids right now how to develop resilience and it's hard because it requires suffering to learn. It's the hardest it thing. And we want to go, oh shit, that sucks. But in staying in that, that's where we learn what we're capable of to be able to handle it. And then we can let the ne negative energy hit us, but not deeply affect us. Cause that's all we have to do is let go of the negative energy. And I think that's that shift in my brain from I'm instead of assuming this won't work in my life, I'm going to assume it will. And I think it has dramatically impacted me that shift in my brain the, to what, the I can. What about microdosing? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, that's another one. Um, that has had a profound effect on me. Uh, but I don't, I have yet to have a really, I don't want to say that. That's not true. I, I, it has made me a much freer person with the world around. I'll, I, I wasn't, uh, on anything last night, but, um, when I was in, uh, uh, Last night I was at Oracle or at the Chase Center in San Francisco to see Gonzaga play San Francisco. And mm. I had this, this is a moment of elevation of like, what would it feel like? Like that shifting of brain. I sat there and every single person around me was laughing and smiling at the exact same time. Wow. And it was weird. I mean, like, I'm not talking about like five or 10 people. I'm talking about hundreds of people because Gonzaga was playing out of their mind and everybody was into it. And I just looked at Are they making a run? Are they making a run for March Madness? They're trying. They're not. They're, this is probably the weakest team they've had in 20 years. Uh, okay. They're young. They're young. They don't have a core player to find yet uh, that is elevated. They don't have that player this year. Anyways. As I'm seeing that and I had this flash, it was like, is it possible for a humanity to go through a Me Too movement that shifts them in a way that we stop that polarity and start loving our neighbor? It's that simple, just to that nth degree of just loving the person next to you. And it felt in that moment, I had this very deep sense of experiential feeling of this is what unity feels like. Mm. It was wild. It was one of, the, one of the more wild experiences I've ever had in my life, and it only lasted for about four seconds, but it was this vision of unity where humanity can elevate to a point where it stops fighting so much because that's the polarities and says, oh, guess what? The more valuable place to be in is here in the center, you know? That's what our parents' generation was trying to get to after World War II, is to this place where we- all, had, They're we, on the same page. We're all going to get out of this war, roll up our um, right. boots they're and our, all our, our sleeves. We're all going to work hard. You didn't, see, you didn't see the kind of welfare state. Everybody was just gunning for getting better. And for even, um, even yeah. the 60s, um, African-American community, um, there's a lot of, especially the married um, ones with kids tended to do much better. And then something happened. I don't know if it was after Lyndon Johnson or not, but things changed dramatically. But, and, and, and our bodies too. So, I mean, if you look back in the 40s and 50s about, in, in the 30s and 40s and 50s about how people looked in their suits, everybody was thin, lithe, right? right? The ex all the stuff was going on. So that actually, so to, to that point, one of the things that um, I've recognized is in my youth, racism was extensive, like extensive. And although we've dealt with it, I don't feel like we've had a moment. That's the one issue that I think would go the farthest is this idea of what if we could 
have a moment of reconciliation collectively between blacks and whites or whites and people of color, I think is because whites are this group that is their backs are against the wall and there's got to be that moment of peace because that's how Paula Freire talked about it is that the, when the oppressed rise up and discover their value, they don't gain their value back by killing the oppressor. Mm -hmm. They gain it back by lifting the oppressor up and forgiving them and saying, okay, let's move together collectively forward. And realistically, can there be this moment where we can extensively deal with this collective problem of racism in our history and say, visually to the people is this is a moment of reconciliation and whites saying, yeah, that is our lineage. Let's move forward. Can we find forgiveness and reconciliation? That's what I think. Uh, and the reason why I brought that up is I'm in the process right now of looking at developing a documentary with that idea, because I think that is one of the biggest potentials for radical change in our communities. Is oh, the CRC idea. as well. Are you going to tie, tie into Mandela and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in, in South Africa as well? Very similar kinds of constructs, right? Yes. I guess the question is, how do you perpetuate it? Because it seems to me mm -hmm. that even yeah, though they made, great, they made great strides. That's a really um, important point. But let me speak to it because uh, yeah. I, I thought about that. It's the perpetuation problem is the second problem to solve. The first is we need a landmark moment like a declaration of independence or a some landmark movement, like a million man march thing that says collectively we are starting this process. And I think that's the first thing that needs to happen. And and but that is an important question to answer. How do you sustain that movement? Because there'll be backlash, yeah. but they're really falling apart in South that, Africa today. Yeah. Today it's like it's, remember it's when sad. do you remember when Obama got elected? Unfortunately, um, yeah, <laughs> I know you, you're not a fan of, I totally get it. I go, but racially, that is one of the most defining moments in African-American history ever, because this was a black man rising to that level to say, okay, we broke through and we're, we're now part of the process. That was a huge moment. And that's the a type of level of event I would love to see happen. That is something that is landmark, that is collectively, people were weeping because for the first time they could see the glass ceiling had been broken. And that's all I'm thinking of is how do you, how do you create those moments? Like what Nate is trying to do, those moments in communities that are landmark moments. So, yeah. All right. Let's go to the next oh. one. Uh, what was it? What do we got next? So all this stuff in our reality is made up of things that are almost all nothing, no thing. And now as a result, they're looking at the physical part of the atom. They're seeing that those things, which, which we thought were solid, are made up of smaller things that aren't actually solid at all. They're only solid sometimes. They have a potential of being solid. And so we live in this distorted reality where we think that everything is physical around us, but it's not. It's all energy. We've been given these five senses, these energetic vibrational interpretation devices. <laughs> that simulate a physical reality, which is our, our body suit, right? That can hear things as if it's really there, but you're not really hearing words that I'm speaking. Your tympanic membrane is interpreting very specific vibration and energy that I'm speaking from a mouth that doesn't even really exist <laughs> and translating it into this conversation. Like if you're not wowed, then I don't know if you're alive. All right, what do you think, man? He's, he's right. I mean, you look at a chair and the chair and you, you can sit in the chair. And if you really open what that is up, you see that it's actually just a bunch of tightly knit um, molecules, right? It's, it's the nature of the wood that well, brings together. For definition, for definition, for our audience, let's yeah. give the audience what he means by the part that doesn't exist. Exist. It's 99.99999% is empty. Nothing. Yeah. There's nothing. Okay. There's nothing there. Yeah. And now he's talking about the 0.000001% that we think does now really doesn't. 
That's the, well, that, I just that's clarify that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, to, but, but to be fair, I mean, we always, we always talked about, it. I mean, there are, there are objects that can pass through a chair, right? There are objects that are so small, call it a quark or a photon, that it's so small, it could just pass through a chair, like it's going through like a big tree forest, right? Here's a big redwoods, and I'm just passing straight through it. And that's something we know ontologically true, physically true, uh, f- f- physics in, in terms of metaphysics, right? But I guess the question I would have is, A, um, if it is mostly nothing or it could be potential, does that mean you could change it at will? Does that mean it could be changed? Does it mean the potentiality and the reality of it could be in the state of flux? Okay, I'll give you – let me answer that question because I actually thought about this the other day. Uh, I was playing around with the idea of what if natural laws are simply things we've agreed to historically that our body has gotten used to over time. So if I smack my head on a rock, it's going to damage my brain, right? And so I put my hand up against the window because it was kind of an interesting thing. There was nothing, you know, visually it looked like it was nothing in front of me, but I could feel the glass and I knew the glass was there, but... I thought, what if the only thing stopping my hand going through this glass is my belief in the law that the glass is? Because it's just a construct. And my world includes the construct of that possibility. So how then did Jesus, I'm going to use Jesus as an example, heal? Because last night I saw a guy uh, at uh, Chase Center and he was severely handicapped from drug use. Like it, mm. he was, and his whole leg, I think, had gout. Um, was he a homeless and, person? Or yeah, he was homeless. In the, yes. Okay, yeah. And no, oh, I'm sorry. He wasn't at uh, Chase Center. He was at the Starbucks where I met my son for lunch. And I was going, how did Jesus just go say, I'm going to heal that? Like, that's what I want to be able to do. And that was the thing is, is it simply because I don't believe I can do it? That's the question I'm asking for myself right now is, is my limitations created by my own self limitations to this uh, this narrative, this grand narrative, the matrix, when he got out of the matrix, he could bend a spoon or he contemplates. So that's the question I'm asking right now. Yeah. I, well, he, I he love... defied the law that he was pre, pre-given, right? Exactly. The, ki- the kid helped him understand that, that there was no spoon, right? And that's how he was able to bend it around. And then he got the gift later on. Jesus disappeared through crowds. How did he do that? You know, like Jesus is an easy one because it's one that most people understand or have heard the stories. Like Jesus healed people. I would love, I wanted to heal this guy. I don't know why. He just caught my attention and I wanted to heal him. And I thought, man, why am I not, what is stopping me from being able to heal somebody? It, it's pride. Um, I had the same thing happen to me uh, multiple times where I've seen somebody in a wheelchair and there's almost, a, a, there's, there's something tugging at you to walk up, right. lay hands on him or her and mm-hmm. say, I want you to get up out of this wheelchair and risk the embarrassment and laughing stockness of the whole process when it doesn't happen. And that in the back of our minds, we're thinking that I, I've had that feeling, right? You know, that, like you're not always, you can, you can see a uh, hundred people, but every now and then you've got that. And it's like, damn it. Is that the tug? Is that something that I should have acted on, right? In terms of like even a homeless person, right? You see a hundred, they're, they're asking for money and they're coming up with cute little new signs. Hey, fuck it. Or like flipping it over and this is all positive and like, just give me a beer, right? I mean, sometimes it's really funny and sometimes it's just that. And there are times where you you feel like there's eye contact and I, damn it, I should have probably given that guy something, something about that. It's not just the one in the masses, right? Because you can't do that every day, right? You can't mm-hmm. just have a handful of ones and tens and fives and, and have that out all day. Um, so is, is that what you think it might be? In my mind, that's, that's what would be holding me back is like, I'm going to look like a fucking idiot. It has to be, it's self limitation, but I don't know what the limiters are. Yeah. Like I fundamentally it's, and the only thing I could agree to is that historically my body has always been trained. I can't break that construct. And but what if it's simply the limitation my body has accepted throughout its history? Like how many bodies has my, I have DNA from whoever was first. That's the reality. We all have DNA from the first person and there's a split, but it's hundreds and thousands of bodies in between. 
or I don't know how many it is. I'd be curious to actually know that number, but there's a, a break and there's a learned process. Like I am my line's historical record of survival. Mm-hmm. That's what I am. Fair enough. Yeah. And so is it that survival requires agreeing to that construct? I don't know. Cause Jesus transcended it. And Jesus has always been the best example of living that I've ever found. And, um, he could heal. And he even said we could heal. And I, I, that's the one thing that like when my mom was dying, I wanted to be able to heal her, you know, of course she congestive heart failure and I wanted to be able to heal her. So I, that, that's the question that I'm kind of contemplating, uh, is that, um, do I have the capacity and is it simply because that's the matrix? Cause that's the rule of the matrix. And Neo was able to transcend the matrix. I think that um, th- we talked about having um, somebody I used to know from church who was healed herself, and she's been doing a lot of ministry, very, very charismatic movement. She mm-hmm. might be great to have on board to help us make that next step and to share stories. Have you ever met someone who's in. healed somebody? Um, or been not, healed? Not, not individually, not, 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 not in the way we want to talk about, right? It always yeah. comes down to the withered hand, right? Here, here's a kid from mm-hmm. birth, congenital withered hand, and this guy came up and, and healed that hand. That hand is now completely made whole as what we've heard about in the Bible, right? Or the guy was born blind, and Jesus asks, you know, was it his fault or the sins of the father? Well, it and said the, scales parents, fell from his eyes. Yeah. You know? There's a couple different versions. There's one where he actually makes a mud, and yeah. other times he just heals. But then there's one where they, he looks like they're spindly things, which people give physiological actual healing processes because that's what happens when people come out of a blind state and can heal again. But what we're getting at is can we find something where, you know, this person was in a wheelchair, but they were just bound there for like three years and they just couldn't really do it? I mean, show me, you know, stage four cancer um, on Tuesday. And show me that eradication on Wednesday by going to that faith healer in the same lung, right? Here's the, here's those, here's the x-ray. Here's the Mayo Clinic. Here is, um, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, what's the, um, what's, Seth, what's, what's his name? Joel Osteen's church in, in mm-hmm. Texas. Here's Joel Osteen's church. Here's waving. Here's up on stage. And, uh, and we took a, we took an x-ray after he left the premises and it's gone. Right. I, I think that, I mean, even look at me, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer, right. And, I don't I even call myself a cessationist. You know, cessationists believe that all of the healings that we've seen in, in the in the Bible were relegated to the, um, you know, first century uh, as the apostles continued to grow and expand. And we see, obviously, Paul. Right, Did you learn that there. from John MacArthur? No. Cessationism is, is something that a lot of conservative I'm teasing um, you, I'm people teasing. believe it. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't learn much from John MacArthur. Thank God. Yeah. Um, you no, know, John I, MacArthur is a cessationist. So a oh, very good sure. friend of mine. Yeah, he's, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, he's one of the strictest yeah. cessationists I've ever. For those who don't know, cessationism is the what was it you explained it? What was it? Cessationism is the belief that all of the Holy Spirit gifts that were breathed upon the apostles at Pentecost and what Jesus promised to them, and what we actually saw in the Book of Acts with Peter. Uh, actually, yeah, Peter actually healed a woman named Tabitha or Dorcas. She was dead, and then Paul um, healed, uh, rose somebody from the dead. He fell. He was falling asleep during one of Paul's sermons, falls out the window, drops down dead, and um, Paul heals him completely, brings him back from from the dead, right? So we actually have resurrections, but Jesus did tell us um, greater things you will do than I did. And yet right. the cessations believe that after the apostles left um, and, and that first group were gone, um, it kind of it kind of ended. That was the that was supposed to be the first Did it set include of movements. all the gifts or just speaking in tongues? Because I thought it was oh, just speaking okay. in tongues. No, it would include um, one-on-one healings. So when we talk, okay. I, mean, I don't. John MacArthur would not deny the fact that if we've got the entire church, we had this happen to us at our church in at Ventura Missionary. We were all. I was at a I was at a prayer group with my my good mentor and friend. My wife was at a women's Bible study. We had a friend driving down to San Diego, and we hear that one of the amazing ladies um, of the church, her name was Janice. Um, she was on her deathbed. Uh, everybody's like, she's toast, right? Everybody mm-hmm. stop what you're doing and pray. And we all prayed. We prayed for a freaking hour, dude. Prayed to the Psalms. It was incredible act of community work. My, right. my, my wife was praying. These guys stopped, pulled over by the south of the road and started praying. Right. The, the attending nurse 
became a believer because she pulled out of it. She said, she was a dead woman walking. I am going to be, whatever you guys just did there, whatever this was all about, I want, I want to be a part of this. And it was amazing. She was the nurse. And she says, whatever happened there was an absolute miracle. And we all took credit as a community. Now, what, what we're seeing today is individual people, Benny Hinn or somebody, we're, we're hearing people raising people from the dead in Africa and stuff. But what I'm getting at is, I, I don't think, I think a lot of people are skeptical of still those one-on-one things. Like, God, heal me, right? And all of a sudden, I have this, you know, addiction to heroin and, you know, God can do that. We can see God coming to people in dreams in the Middle East and, and people who are Muslim are seeing Jesus and saying, I want to become a Christ follower now, right? I've met a gentleman who brought someone back to life. And one of the most sincere people I've ever met. Uh, he, so I worked at a, at a Christian organization. City team. A, yeah. City team. Um, and he was basically their spokesman for a lot of their worldwide ministries. And he was extremely genuine and he brought a man back who had been dead for five hours. So it wasn't, and it was documented. The entire town was there. He did it in front of an, a large group of people. He read like um, the guy, the, the guy was like, uh, was he on a monitor? So he had been dead for five hours when my friend arrived in the village. It was kind of like, uh, um, Oh, it was a village. Uh, okay. It, he wasn't yeah. hooked up to an EKG or a mo- monitor. Him. Him. Okay. Yeah. So every, no, he was, there was no monitor. He was dead on a table in a hut. That's, that's what okay. it was like. Um, and the whole there was town no more was in him. They, they, they're like, okay, there's nothing. He, oh, he, no, no, he, okay. he, he had yeah. stopped. He was cold. Got it. So full cold. Um, so he had been in rigor mortis and he came back and he came back to life. And it's hard to like, I'm not against the more that I study energy, the more that I realized how historically what Jesus and Paul and Peter were doing was a movement of energy. Um, I can't remember what her name is, but she says all life is the manipulation of energy. Mm-hmm. And Jesus used it for positive because you can use it for negative, but Jesus used it for positive. Peter healed someone uh, for the positive reason for it. Of course. Um, and I think that's partly why our bodies don't let us see it is because we're not mature enough to handle that kind of responsibility. That would be a, I mean, I don't believe in the, I don't know about Benny Hinn. I've heard stories that he's very real in some respects, and I'm sure we've seen it looks fantastical where it's almost silly, but at the same time, what if it's real? I mean, it has to be it's real to some extent. You can't manufacture a 30 to 40 year career out of fakery. It, that's just not possible. Um well, so supposedly I, I, he's come around. He's actually become a little bit less, um, I mean, when you've got my- all those people and, and he's like- there's a great song about let the bodies hit the floor. I don't know if you ever heard. Oh that God, song. that's so funny. I've seen that video. And then <laughs> he's like, and they're all just lurching and stuff. Yeah. Here's the other thing that I always try to get out of that. It's great to have these wonderful m- movements of elation and being slain in the spirit and stuff. But then what do you go out and do with that? Right. And it's the same thing about the reconciliation thing. It's about also that, that awesome feeling of, of everybody smiling and laughing hundred people around you at the um, Gonzaga game. Mm-hmm. And, um, you can't live in that forever, but it does give you a glimpse of what something like that could look like. And yet, how do you live in, in, in an area of you're not in overdrive, you're not doing 180 miles an hour, but you're cruising along at 80 and everybody's working together and, and, and not having the same kind of speed bumps that we have all the time. So here's my question. And this is what got yeah. me because right before I went in the game, I watched this video about elevating your life. Mm. And the concept is... And, uh, Cleburne talked all about this is that we're going to reach a point where we elevate. And right. is that, is that elevation a moment? Cause that's what was happening in that four seconds. It was almost like a foreshadowing of what Cleburne was talking about was what if I wake up one day and the shift has happened? What would you do with that when you're already like the elevation process? What if it's going to dramatically knock you on your ass because it's going to be so good Um, I'm looking for the good and I'm wondering if what that shift looks like, if it, you know, what he was talking about. I think that's probably one of the biggest biohacks that I've really taken on this year is this idea that I am intimately source. I am. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am. And I've taken on that 
idea now for almost a year. And I think it's pro- that to me is probably the most profound link that has made the rest really, really good. Yeah. Um, so I, don't, I, I, don't, I, still, I, I still differ with you on this because when, well, when Jesus says I, I am, he's, he's quoting um, I am that I am. He's, he's in, it's again, it's John eight fifty eight, And he is literally claiming divinity at that stage, right? So he's right. not just saying I am Cleburne or I am happy and I'm, I am positive. At an energetic level. Yeah, he's there claiming no divinity, and that's why they were going to try to kill him because he he goes, "Oh, who are you? You you you, you know Abraham?" He goes, "Before Abraham was, I am." Right, right. He said, "Are it. you saying you're greater than Father?" And then right. that's when they're like, "Okay, this guy is freaking. This guy's an absolute blasphemer." And what I'm getting, one of the things that I was going to laugh about when when right, when you've talked about like I am God and I'm I am I am fully God. I am part mm-hmm. of that construct. I'm like just. Just give me a give me the, give the audience just a little glimpse of what that moment of creation was like when you breathed life into the world, Jonathan. Just help me understand just that moment of revelation as you as you created. Well, here, here's how I because I and I want yes. you to be a, I want you to tell me what that experience was okay. like. Just give okay. me a little hint. So, uh, I started this idea on my walk with my dog, so that's where I really get into it consistently. I talk about this idea in my head with myself as I walk my dog. It's my meditation time. Mm-hmm. It's I, I'm creative. I shoot reels. I have thoughts. I take thousands of notes. And as I started seeing this possibility, at first it was a possibility of what if I am? Like that was the first question. I thought, what if, can I logically be? And I answered that question and I sent you a text that night because I said, if I can love, that means I am love because I'm part of love. I have love to give. That means I'm connected to source. So all you have to be able to do to prove that you are connected to God or a part of God is that you are capable of loving. So to love, which is the greatest commandment, is simply a call to this idea that you are already connected. You are part of God, but you're the individual expression of God on earth. And there's millions of those. So at a subatomic level, you're all one. But your individual expressions that are radically mentally disturbed through thousands of years of history saying you suck. And we are reaching a point where we're waking up to the reality that we don't suck. That's the epoch that I think is happening. And I think people are waking up. Like, I'm Jonathan in this body. But we're not doing it from our own divinity. We're doing it from something extant. Neo, and this is the argument that I've been making, Neo knew something was driving him and it wasn't him. It, it, it no, no, that's like what it I'm saying. Yeah, it was extant. It was right. not Jonathan him. Jonathan is this world's, my avatar. Yeah. But I remember, and this is a moment in my life that I've never forgotten. I remember the first day I could write my name Jonathan. Okay. Or I was Johnny when I was a kid. So I was writing Johnny. I was in my bed. It was nine o'clock at night. I had been in bed for an hour. I was four or five and I, w- I learned it in kindergarten, I think. I pulled the cover out. I had a flashlight and I wrote my name. I was so proud of that. But that's the moment I became an avatar. Before that, I had no consciousness of identity. Yeah. I didn't need one. And well, that and is- <laughs> Your brain develops too, right? That's where you learn abstractions. You got to a point True. where- True. And kids, don't forget, there's a place in time where kids don't know anything other than themselves. They can't think in outside of themselves, right? They can't think in third party. Um, it's, there's a great story. I forgot it, but it's about yeah, the pirate yeah. and about like somebody would have actually hid something. And like, why would you have thought that, right? Like you're only seeing what's observable to you instead of thinking what somebody else might have done to change that situation, right? Well, I'm seeing so, that right now with my grandson, Kaysen. He's not capable of seeing himself separate from his mom. So when his mom- correct goes into the garage for a second. He freaks out because he doesn't know where he is. Mm-hmm. That's what he's experiencing. And because yeah. he only sees his mom as himself. That's because they, they're one and the same. And I think what's happened is by taking on that, first I took on the possibility, then I took on the opportunity and says, let's try this idea out. What is the cost? And I was very careful going into that saying, I'm going to listen to the results very clearly. And by seeing myself as source and connected to God, I am, it 
I think solves the problem in the Garden of Eden, which is the am I good or evil? I am a right. collective representation of both as an expression in the world, living that out. But there's full grace. That's what the cross did. The cross established grace was already true. It's always been true since the garden. Everything was good. And living into that reality that I am fully connected. And then I think this is the birth of an age where we are going to see the fullest expression. That's how God works. God always comes in in the end. We've in had 2,000-year increments, it sounds like. Could, because why did God choose 2,000 years ago to come in mm -hmm. and finally say, here's the evidence of the cross, right? Or he took the Roman Empire. He took a terrible kinds of thing. He took a yes. potential scripture from Isaiah. talks about he'll be pierced for our transgressions, like nailed to the cross. So... I mean, we always wonder about those things. The law took, was given hundreds of years beforehand. It's not perfect to the 2000, but it took 2,500 years for the original law, for the Ten Commandments to show up. Hammurabi's law had been there. So I think you're 2,000 yeah. years. But to that point, it's taken us 2,000 years to really acknowledge that grace is true. The church is yeah. waking up to, okay, grace is true. We got to get over ourselves. And it's embracing that like when i was a kid grace was there but hey stay away from it because there was a you know, there was a there was a uh, there was a caveat you don't to the grace. yeah you yeah. didn't want to give license everybody was worried about license and here's the reality there is license hitler is in heaven people he is he's there and it's not that he because here's the reality any Actually, location he go we go to, of, i thought he has to go through eons of tribulation but he's there because there is no time That's there true. is no time that's true. So he's there. It's a representation. It's an avatar like me of possibility. That's all Hitler is. He's a representation of possibility of the human idea in this narrative we call life, the matrix. And he's going to be there. So the question is not how do I get him out of heaven, but how do I learn to deal with him being there? And you can only do that through love. Yeah. You can only do that through love. Mao's not because gonna, love, he, killed 80, he killed 80 million people. Mao, Mao's not going to make it, dude. He's totally. I know. And that's the hard part of the kingdom of God is that it includes the criminal. It yeah. did. Jesus was crucified with two criminals to his left and right. And yep. that that is the one I think burns people the most. But we never, because if you and I are both the God image at a, at a subatomic level, we're both avatars having different expressions of the same idea. I don't, I don't want to kill you because you're me. And that's right. what I think we're waking. That's what mindfulness is waking us up to. That I think the world is, and I think Gen Z is halfway there, that they're tired of fighting against each other, but they don't know how to love each other. They've been, the polarization is only possible when you lose the concept of love. And that's oh. why the evangelical church, which was the voice box for most of America, took us in a wrong path. It got away from love and went to politics. And that is but what that is us. a progress. So there's, they've moved from wanting to kill each other to not wanting to kill each other. They're too tired of that. And they're too beat up from all the bullshit. Now they just need to lo learn to love. There's still a ton of us older folks that are still willing to bring up arms. We're still, and, we're still at the level of fighting. Well, also I want to say in terms of love, I'm not saying love uh, just means, oh, let's have a woo-woo, ooey-gooey experience where we just deal with our people. It's not. Love is the judgment of good. It's saying, Rich, you are good, so I'm not going to kill you. Okay? And in that space, we deal with those people who break that law. That's the only law there is, is the law of love. That's it. There's no other laws. We create laws, but the only law that exists in the universe is the law of love that says you are good. You're here. Guess what? The first law of thermodynamics is you're here. Now you got to deal with it. So that's consciousness. And if we don't wake up to removing those conflicts, but I think this is God's story anyway, so we're just participants in it. And that's the mystery of it is, as Alan Watts said, we're going to wake up and go, oh, that was a cool dream. Totally. That's my, that's my, that's my one big trump card is, is that I think Alan Watts got it right. So we're going to wake up realizing we are God who has played a trick on ourselves so we could have a good laugh. Yep. So <laughs> that's a good way to finish. <laughs> How can you beat that? To all of our listeners, please subscribe, review, let us know who you'd like to hear. If you have someone you'd like to introduce to us to be on the show, please do. There's uh, you can go to livinginthematrix.ai 
uh, and we are Living Matrix Podcast on Instagram. Would love to have you follow. Uh, this has been one of my, uh, th- I love these. These were the original conversations we've had for the last 15 years of just talking stuff and having these wild ass conversations. So I love that, Rich. It's been awesome. To all of our listeners, have a wonderful week and uh, we will talk to you soon. Much love, everybody. Electric.